Shadows of the Empire was conceived as a multimedia project, telling one interconnected story through a variety of mediums, including the novelization, comic series, video game, trading cards, soundtrack, and toy line. With the release of the special editions and episode one pushed back to 1997 and 1999 respectively, Shadows of the Empire's release in 1996 served as a pilot for the wave of materials that was to come. Compared to its contemporaries, Shadows of the Empire did very well and made it to number five on the New York Times bestseller list for the week of May 5th, 1996 and was ultimately on the list for six weeks. Now in my reread, I remembered the characters from Shadows of the Empire pretty well. Dash Rendar, Guri, and Shizor did not come as a surprise to me, but I was surprised by how different the plot is from the video game. It seems that my memories of Shadows of the Empire were pretty much limited to the Nintendo 64 game, and the book's different. The video game covers a wider range of time, and this is set very distinctly between Empire and Return of the Jedi. A brief summary. Han Solo is trapped in carbonite, and Luke, Leia, Lando, and Chewie first need to track down where Boba Fett is before they can rescue him. Meanwhile, Prince Shizor, the head of the Black Sun criminal organization, wants to replace Darth Vader as the Emperor's right-hand man, and he thinks the best way to do this is to kill Luke Skywalker before Vader can get his hands on him. Perry had written a number of novelizations or other licensed fiction, so it's not a surprise that Lucasfilm picked him for Shadows of the Empire. I feel like he has a pretty good grasp on our main three, I suppose, with Lando sort of taking place of Han in a way. Luke is still learning to be a Jedi, he's conflicted about the revelation that Vader is his father, but he's doing the best he can. He makes a new lightsaber and he gains some new understandings about the Force. Leia, meanwhile, is conflicted. She loves Han, she wants Han back at any cost, but she still really likes Luke. I mean, he's one of her best friends. So when it becomes apparent that someone's trying to kill Luke, she wants information on who does it. And for better or for worse, probably for worse, she decides to try to see what Black Sun knows about it. Lando also wants Han back, uh, but he's a little annoyed with all the changes that Han made to the beloved Falcon. And Chewie's there. Like, he wants Han back too, but he's pretty much protecting Leia. In The Empire Strikes Back, Han told him to take care of the princess, and that's what he's doing, and he's doing a pretty good job of it. However, Han is missing. He's in Carbonite. He hasn't made his way to Jabba's palace. A bit in the first third or so of the book is that they're trying to track down where Boba Fett is. They find him, they lose him, so obviously they're not going to get Han at this point. So Perry has introduced a new character to take the place of Han in a way, Dash Rendar, also a Corellian, but unlike Han, a wealthy-ish Corellian. He comes from a well-to-do family who got kicked off a of Coruscant by the Emperor, and that led to him also getting kicked out of the Imperial Academy. So he's a smuggler, he fills the Han role of he's not really for anyone's side, he's just for money which is fine, but I don't find he's really necessary. But in a way, he also gives off sort of Gary Stu vibes. Gary Stu is the male counterpart to Mary Sue. So we have Dash who has a ship and it's better than the Falcon and it's faster than the Falcon. And he's so good at shooting and everyone's just like, wow, that Dash, he's really good at this. I guess really old, really fast. Especially because it feels like he's almost in some sort of contest with Han to be like Han but better. And honestly, we don't need a Han counterpart. Lando's doing perfectly fine. Dash is just here so that everyone can be like, wow, what a guy, Dash. If only he'd join the rebellion. He's not going to join the rebellion. 
Then we have our bad guys. We have the Emperor manipulating everyone behind the scenes. Vader, who wants to bring Luke in league with him because Luke is so powerful, has so much potential. And then we have Prince Shizor. Prince Shizor is number one, royalty. Number two, hugely wealthy. Number three, sort of like the Emperor's third in command. But it's confusing because he's not part of the Empire. He's independent, but he helps the Empire when it helps him. And it seems as though the whole leak the information about the second Death Star to the Rebellion is Shizor's idea. I doubt that this is Shizor's idea but the Emperor's idea, but he's just so intelligent and wealthy and like the Emperor trying to be a chess master and put everyone in its place that I'm sort of glad this is the only book he appears in. I think he plays a role in the Bounty Hunter trilogy that came out in 1998, but I'm not sure if I ever read that one, so... Shizor, he's a ladies man, he's wealthy. I don't like Shizor, creeps me out. And then we have Guri, who is a human replica droid. Basically, she is Star Wars equivalent of the replicants from Blade Runner in that she looks like a person, can pass for a person, but she's a droid and she's been programmed to be an assassin and she's super strong and she's super good looking. I really like Guri. It's fun to have a female character who is so powerful. I wish we had gotten a little bit more about her programming and the way she was made made and basically why she follows Shizor, but at the same time she doesn't seem to 100% not trust him, but accept him as like her superior. I know that Guri shows up again in a sequel comic, which I never read, but I'm glad she did because she's interesting. I feel like there could have been a lot more done with her. And then we have the droids. They're there. They fly the Falcon at one point, which is a little unbelievable, but they're very bad at it. So I guess that is par for the course. So Shadows of the Empire being set between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi is not a sequel, but an interquel, basically filling in the gap between two existing pieces of canon. So it's perhaps understandable why Perry would make references back, especially to Empire Strikes Back, but I feel like there are maybe too many of them and the flashbacks are too lengthy. In the prologue, we get to see the scene again where Vader talks to the Emperor about Luke, but this time we learn that Shizor was there standing over the Emperor's shoulder. And so he knows apparently that Vader was Anakin Skywalker. He instantly assumes that Luke Skywalker is a relation to Vader and decides that in his power play with Vader and the Emperor that he really the best thing that he can do here is save this information for later. Likewise, in the first chapter, we get two lengthy flashbacks. The first is Leia having a nightmare in which she remembers when Han was frozen in carbonite. It goes on a little too long for me, mostly because if you're reading this book, you've seen the movie, you know what happens, you don't need it replayed for you in precise, exact detail. And then we get Luke who goes inside a circus tent on... Tatooine? He's on the high wire and as he's making his way across using the force, he remembers what happened in the cave at Dagobah. This is another one where it goes on for pages and I don't think it's necessary. We know what Luke's struggling with. We know what he saw. I feel like it could have been painted in much less precise strokes. And then we just have throwaway references all the way through the story of, you know, the creature from the garbage compactor and stuff like that. I know why they're there to remind people, you're reading a Star Wars book, but I don't like them. I always prefer when it's a new story instead of just rehashing old stuff. We also get to see how the Rebel Alliance captured the plans for the second Death Star. I always thought that it was solely something that the Bothans did, but it turns out it was the Bothans contacting Leia. Luke gets the message, he's a big part. They're able to get the plans, I assume, but Luke's captured by bounty hunters and blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about inserting Luke and Dash into that. 
because it's very clear that they don't know what's been uncovered, just that it's something important. But I just find it unlikely that they would have been there when the plans were captured, or in this case, when the computer was captured. I also feel like Perry goes out of his way to offer explanations about some of the things we see in Return of the Jedi, most specifically Leia's Bausch costume and Luke's black garb. But the explanations we get for it are, they're okay, they're decent, but I feel like they could be better. Leia has Bausch's costume because Guri killed him, and that's how Guri sneaks her onto Coruscant. It's an okay story, I just wish that Leia had obtained this disguise in a more active manner. I mean, heck, the Forces of Destiny cartoons gave a better story behind it, which was pretty much that Leia herself takes the outfit from Bausch. And then it turns out that Luke's black Jedi garb was clothes that Dash got for him on Coruscant, which, okay, cool. I guess he doesn't have much clothes and that explains why he's still wearing it come the next movie, but... Likewise, for a story set in between the two movies, I guess we wouldn't expect a lot to change, but I was surprised by how much was static. Obviously, they don't find Han, they don't release him. They find out that Boba Fett's on a planet, they send Dash to make sure he's on the planet, Dash says he is, they go and they can't even get close to him. And then their plan after that is just to go back on Tatooine and I guess wait for him to show up. Someone's trying to kill Luke, Leia approaches Black Sun, finds out that it's Black Sun and they just sort of trash the place and then leave. Uh, so I guess on the one hand that means that there's only one person now looking for Luke and that's Vader and that's we can handle that. On the other hand it feels like maybe sort of an anticlimactic way to handle it which is strange because I feel like the climax was one of the things that Perry did well. We have Luke and co breaking into Shizor's palace to release Leia. They cause mayhem. Lando throws a thermal detonator down into the basement. They completely blow it up. They're having a dogfight ship battle in the skies of Coruscant and then Vader blows up Shizor's skyhook. So just Black Sun's decimated. But I guess what I find hard to believe here is that it was difficult for Leia and Chewie to get in, Guri had to procure disguises for them, except when Luke and Lando and then Dash need to get to Coruscant, they just hide behind a freighter and apparently everyone knows this trick and they all hide behind freighters. In the same way, the next X-Wing book, Wedge's Gamble, is all about how the New Republic takes Coruscant and it's difficult and it's hard. So knowing that Rogue Squadron, the Millennium Falcon, and the Outrider were all involved in this shootout in Coruscant and, and all got away feels improbable to me. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it hard to get into Coruscant and then also really easy. And you can't have it hard to retake the planet, but at the same time, a bunch of the Rebel Alliance and one smuggler were just shooting it out, were able to escape. You would think that there would be like a planetary shield, something that would make it more difficult to get in and to exit. That's what I always believed, that there was a reason why it was hard to get spies on Coruscant, and that sneaking behind a freighter wasn't the answer, and that just shooting to light speed wasn't easy. And while I was rereading this, I wondered why had I never reread it before? It's a decent Star Wars book. People are portrayed adequately. Why did I not ever reread it? And why did my memory of the plot all derive from the video game? Well, I think it comes down to the subplot with Shizor and Leia. As a young teen reading this book, that made me so uncomfortable to the point that I did not want to reread it. And when I was rereading this and was reading those parts, it was really hard for me to continue. Not in the way that it took me a month to read Jedi Search by Kevin J. Anderson, but just that I didn't like what I was reading. Essentially, Shizor is the kind of wealthy man that has never been told no. But it goes beyond that. He doesn't just sexually harass Leia, he actively tries to remove her agency. It's one thing to go, oh, this is an attractive lady. I would like 
to have a thing with her. That's one thing. I can buy that because in that case, Leia has the ability to say very flattering, but no, um, mm -mm. But Chisor, as a Faelene, has the ability to give off these pheromones. And we're not talking the kind of pheromones that you plug into an outlet to calm your cat down. These are the kind of pheromones that affect people's willpower to the point that people aren't able to say no to him. And this is the part where it was very uncomfortable for me because it doesn't just become uncomfortable dude hitting on Princess Leia but it's dude hitting on Princess Leia and she's essentially drugged and can't say no. Fortunately, she has strong enough willpower that she's able to do that, say no, absolutely turn him down. But until she's able to figure it out and do that, it's really uncomfortable for me to read. And even afterwards, it's almost like she blames herself for what happened. And that is 100% not the case. Leia, you are the victim here. But yeah, that bit was hard for me to read. Perry leaves things a little open-ended at the conclusion. It's pretty clear that Guri is alive because she apparently took one of the paragliders and got away from the palace before it blew. Dash looks like he's smashed by rocks, but if you played Shadows the Empire video game, you know that he made it out too to live another day. And I guess you could also argue that possibly Shizor is not dead. When Vader gives him the ultimatum, he says something about how he has two minutes and the skyhook is destroyed. But maybe, maybe he got out. I hope he didn't because I don't like him, but it's left open-ended. So, Shadows and the Empire, it's a decent Star Wars story. It fills in the gaps between two of the movies. It also has a Han Solo stand-in, who I'd only describe as a budget Han Solo. Sorry, Dash, you just can't measure up to Han's legacy. We also have an interesting villain, a very intelligent villain, who's feuding, I suppose, with Vader. Unfortunately, he also creeps me out because of his behavior towards Leia, and that made that part of the book difficult for me to read. But on the whole, I'd say it was interesting. It filled in the gaps. The final action scenes were very exciting, so it's worth a try. Next time, I'll be jumping back into the X-Wing books with Wedge's Gamble by Michael A. Stackpole.